So without further ado, I will pass it over to our speaker, Al Flastery. Al? Thanks, Sarah. Uh, and welcome everybody to uh, part two of this uh, continuum. And this is actually the uh, the useful part. Uh, well, not to say that what we uh, went through two weeks ago wasn't useful, but this is actually the practical part, I guess. Um, and we're going to start. We're going to talk about virtual articulation, uh, specifically in the three shape system. And I got to tell you, when I started looking into this. And I started going online and pulling up everything I could find. I started with uh, what 3Shape puts out there from their manual and other things. I uh, watched every YouTube video available, and there was nothing um, of any substance that I could find out there, really. Very sparse explanations, very little instructions on really what all this means. And so um, I had, you know, like everybody else, I think, muddled through this and kind of figured out a little bit of what's going on. But I just want to go over some of the settings in the in the VA in the virtual articulation just to make sure we're all clear on what they do and what they're used for. And of course, um, <clears throat> when we when we first start the uh, the the virtual articulator, we see this screen here, and it has this button at the bottom called Optimize Occlusion. And I'll tell you this, um, it does try to reorient the, the uh, jaws into um, a, a position of maximum intercuspation, but it can be very dangerous. And we'll talk more about this later. I don't really like this a lot, although uh, it has a place. Uh, but then when we go into the gear or the setup page, I mean, pardon me, when we can, <clears throat> the setup page, we see these two icons in the middle, one that saves the, play, play, the current placement to file. And I will talk about you know, why we want to use this and what it's for later. And then the other one is to perform an auto placement within the articulator, which is extremely important once we understand what this really does. Uh, we also see, uh, of course, the icon to use the articulator. Uh, the one on the upper left corner, which takes us back where we started. And of course, the uh, settings for uh, Conjure Guidance and Bennett. Now, when we actually move into the use the articulator function, the, the upper right icon of the articulator, we get this screen. And, uh, you know, this confused me a little bit uh, at first, really, uh, but, but all these, um, you can simply block movements that you don't want to have happen when you're actually dragging the jaws manually with that little red dot uh, that appears on the models. So you can slowly move it through movements if you want to inspect them. I find it doesn't work very well. It's kind of rough and it kind of jerky. Um, but you can lock out. I do lock out um, protrusion and I lock out um, um, uh, side shift when I want to try this. It seems to make it work a little better. These these options here are were a little bit confusing. The auto shut mode, um, it, it basically puts the inclusion to the first point of contact. I'm not a big fan of that one. Um, just because uh, it's not necessarily what I want. I'm pretty careful in my um, scanning of occlusion, and we're going to go over that later. I really prefer to keep just contact mode on where it finds centric, <sighs> excuse me, uh, where it is based on my occlusion scan and anything I've done maybe through my optimization if I've done that or if I've moved the jaws a little bit. And again, we'll talk more about whether we should or should not even ever do that uh, later. Now, these, um, again, you know, uh, the contact mode being on means it prevents jaws from penetrating, which, which is important. Um, you really don't want that to happen because then you'll certainly uh, have occlusal issues. And the uh, button here for standard coloring, which really just shows everything in blue and it's pretty useless. It really doesn't show you much. Um, well, it's as useful as articulator paper, but one of the beauties of um, this virtual articulator is that it allows us to classify movements from, from balancing to working to protrusive to broad centric in a way that lets us see what is what as opposed to having just one color. And this information is really useful. We'll talk about using this in a moment um, as we go through this lecture. But here, these three um, selections here, uh, record contacts, uh, collide and sizal plate, and collide designs. That was also one of those things that was a little bit confusing. And pretty much we always want to record contacts. We always want to collide in size of plate, which means 
that tooth guidances are in effect. In other words, it respects uh, where the teeth are in the stone casts or the scanned stone casts, the unprepared teeth, uh, as if we were um, working the models together. And then this one, uh, Collide Designs, it's intended to be used only in cases of interior guidance where we actually want our tooth that we have modeled to uh, be respected in terms of guiding uh, the mandibular arch. And so uh, we definitely need this uh, when we're doing interior guidance because we want to see uh, what are, allow the cuspid, the lingual of the cuspid, to actually lift off um, the um, mandible during lateral movements and protrusive movements uh, so we can design it properly. We can design the incline properly to basically disclude the posterior teeth. And again, we're going to get more into this as time goes by. Now, the first thing I noticed digging into virtual articulation is that the where it puts the model is completely wrong. It's not in the physiologic place. It's not where we want it to be, and we have to correct that uh, because it's never right. And even where this plane is, uh, on this particular articulator, it's not even centered uh, between the two bows, and it's in a slightly different orientation on every different articulator that's available within this system. And we'll, we'll look at that a little bit later on, but I really don't want to spend a lot of time on that because uh, it's not really that important, but these concepts are. So, you know, <clears throat> I go back to what we talked about last week with uh, these, these anatomical averages that came from Bonwell right, where the maxilla sits 100 to 110 millimeters uh, from the condyles. It's centered between the upper and lower bows, and it leans at a 10 degree down tilt from posterior to anterior. And this is all according to Bonwell, and these are the standards that I use and have worked extremely well, and I, I believe that they really address practically every case that we do, okay, as far as allowing us to function properly. So if we look at what we have here, the distance here between the bows is 108 millimeters. And so the midline would be at 54 millimeters from either bow, okay, or from the top in this particular case. So that's where our uh, incisal plane should be, uh, which means we're 11 millimeters low uh, by where it's initially placed. So this is a place where I will activate um, the measuring tool the grid so that I can find the proper uh, place for this model. And again, I want to move it up uh, to where it's 54 millimeters from the top bow. <laughs> Pardon me. And you can use the measuring tool to determine that. And we're about 100 to 110 millimeters from the condyles forward. And so if I look where that spot is uh, from where it originally placed the cast, not only does it have to come up, but it's got to come forward in the articulator about 20 millimeters or so. OK, so you can actually go to the gear, go to this and place the uh, maxillary incisor um, overlay on the horizontal line and then move your teeth forward until they're about 20 millimeters ahead of, of the, the guide here, because that's where we want to be. And that'll give us a pretty good uh, orientation as far as the anterior posterior position. And then you can measure back to the condyles. And you know what I find is that because actually that condyle is sticking towards us out of the screen, this measurement is not 100% accurate. Um, Actually, I think that if you are pretty much lined up with this right here, where the incisal pin is, we're pretty good. Anywhere in this area is pretty good for getting the anterior posterior dimension of this. Okay, so now we've accomplished two things. We've got it in the center, 54 millimeters from uh, the top bow, and we've got it about 100 millimeters or so from the condyles forward. Okay, now we need to put this at a 10 degree down tilt. OK, so you can grab that red ball, rock the articulator back, and then we bring our ticketer forward. We've got, uh, this was a guess, about a 10 degree down tilt now. Um, how important is this? Um, we mount 99% of our cases at 10 degrees. But I got curious as to, well, what really is 10 degrees here? If somebody really wants to get this right, and, and then, then we're going to save this information uh, with these two icons up here once we get the placement perfect on our first case. And so I just drew a line right through this first square. That's 45 degrees. 
And then I realized that if we go um, halfway through that, we're at 22 and a half degrees. And then I got out my protractor and said, you know, if we count eight blocks over right there, at that little intersection, if we draw this line through that, that's 10 degrees, you know, so count eight, look at that corner, draw your red line through, and that's 10 degrees. So it'll give you a way to get that pretty close to being right uh, on your initial placement. I certainly don't do this every time uh, by any means, but once you get a feel for what that looks like, you can either um, call up your saved position here, okay, and, and apply it to a, a new uh, scan of occlusion, or you can just do it manually and just get close, okay, is the key here. All right, so we're 54 millimeters from the top bow. We're <clears throat> in this picture a little far forward. Uh, but again, we want to verify that we're about 100 millimeters out. And then I want to look from the front and make sure that my midline is directly behind the pin. That is, unless it's not supposed to be, uh, because this patient is asymmetric, but in general, we want this right behind the incisal pin so we can control our incisal embrasure on the restorations, especially when we're doing an anterior case. And the best way to really uh, see, pardon me, <clears throat> so once I've got this placement worked out, and it takes a little while, it's not easy to move this articulator a little bit to get everything lined up. I've um, suggested a three shape that they have a centering, maybe an F1 key will center the model or center the articulator perfectly on the side and then the F2 perfectly from the front so you don't have to try to move it those little bits with the mouse which is very difficult. But once we have the proper placement, we can save it by clicking this icon here, give it a name, and I just called it proper 320 placement. Okay, save it. And then after that, um, would you like to make this the default for future orders? And you can say yes, which means that it should use that placement information whenever you scan any future uh, occlusion. And I'm not sure exactly uh, what it's recording, to tell you the truth, with this, but it sort of works. Uh, so I say yes, and then I look at any given case that I'm doing and where it places it, and if I have to correct it, I do. Okay. Now, uh, and, and you know, you can play around with that a little bit and 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 try saving a couple different cases and see uh, which ones really give you the best uh, results down the road. But 3Shape does have this system available uh, that allows us to use a transfer plate to basically take the mounting uh, positions of the mandible and the maxilla from the articulator without having to scan occlusion. But this is, it's, it's cool, <coughs> excuse me, it does work, uh, but it's very tricky to set up. And so I want to go through this because it's kind of a cool deal. You don't have to scan any occlusion. But again, it's extremely trick. Um, number one, you've got to make sure that you're using a calibrated articulator. In this case, I'm a, I am really like the, the, the Mark 300 series, the 320 in particular. Um, and I bought the calibration uh, device that allows me to put this on the articulator. There's a pin that drops through. And if it drops through clean, it means my articulator is in perfect um, uh, relationship. It also sets the perfect uh, inner bow width. In other words, it gives you a zero position. So you put these on, you can check the articulator by dropping this pin. And then when you put your incisal pin on and drop it to your table and lock it, you have a perfectly calibrated zero pin. And that's really important that we know that we have a perfect zero pin if we're going to try to do this. So these things make it quite difficult if you don't have this device, which isn't cheap. I, you know, 500 bucks maybe, I think, in that ballpark. Uh, but if you use articulators like I do, it's worth having so you can uh, double check and get a zero pin whenever you need it and make sure your articulators are, are in proper calibration. So um, now these objects have indexing pins. The lower calibration object has these two holes and the upper calibration object has these two bumps. All right. And, you know, again, I'm not sure who was thinking what when they designed this, but these bumps mean you can't place this on a mounting platform and have it sit flat which you need to do to mount this thing in order to get it in the right place to scan it and calibrate your system. So these bumps are 1.7 millimeters high, which is a problem. Again, it won't sit flat, all right? 
And so I knew that I was going to have to to basically fill in that space uh, on, on that calibration object, the maxillary one, because it needs to get mounted first. And lo and behold, turns out the sheet of blaze plate wax that I had just laying around was 1.7 millimeters. Freaking miracle, right? So I just took it, cut some holes in it, and laid it on that, laid it on the block so that now it would sit exactly in the sit flat on my mounting platform. And this is a universal platform that Whitman excels and it, you can tilt it in any direction that you want. And it's got a knob that lets you lower and raise it straight up and straight down. So you really kind of need this too. And uh, right now we're, we're kind of, we're, we're working on a way to be able to have a jig that will transfer this information to a user that doesn't have all these things so they can still use the transfer system, but that's coming. So as you can see, this plate, this is my upper calibration object. The bottom of it is exactly midway um, from upper to lower bow. And what I want to do is get this mounting plate really up against this snug. And again, this thing tilts all around. It doesn't have a fixed position. So you just you move it up until it contacts the bottom. You keep going. It'll straighten itself out. And now this is parallel to the bottom of this calibration object, directly in the center of the articulator. But we got a problem because we had to put 1.7 millimeter block out on that upper object because of those bumps, right? So we got to drop this down 1.7 millimeters to compensate. And you can check that just with that piece of base plate wax that we used uh, that were actually there. So now you can see, since we had to get this up to basically block out those bumps, we had to drop our table and really the table in the center is where the bottom of that metal block is now. Okay. This is just three shape and all their wisdom doing something a little bit backwards, uh, but it's the way it is right now. And just be aware. Now I use some block out, uh, some, some base plate wax here to basically box this in so I can pour stone almost all the way up to where the mounting ring is. Cause we don't want to try to mount this much stone at one time because the, the dimensional change of the stone will make this inaccurate. And we have to have these mountings just ridiculously accurate for this system to really, really work well. So you want to, you want to box that in, pour it with your mounting stone. And in this case, I used actual, you know, zero expansion die stone i used i used um a white die stone for this let that set you should let it set overnight actually okay because because um the shrinkage continues for a long time trust me on this okay i'll show you what we discovered and of course then it's carefully positioned there's a notch for the left to right center line here a horizontal line here we line this thing up and then we finish our mounting with a small amount of stone to very much minimize the amount of dimensional change that happens when this stone sets. This again has been set for 24 hours. Clean it really, really good, okay? Because now we're gonna mate the other one to it and then mount the lower. But, but so I stick it, these, these are magnetic by the way, they will stick together. And again, I'll put a mounting plate on and then I'll look at my distance and I'll box this in. So again, I can do the same thing. I can fill it with stone all the way up to where it's just out of contact with the mounting plate. Let it set for 24 hours, <coughs> excuse me, minimum over the weekends better if you can do that. And then come back and mount with a little tiny bit of stone. And you notice I did put some tape on here to make sure, even though these are magnetic, I didn't want them to move. So a little tape, you really, this needs to be perfectly like I've been saying. So when we're done, should be perfect. Okay, when we close our articulator. And again, once you have these mounted, they serve also as a check for articulation accuracy. These become split casts. And so you can put them on any articulator in your lab. And if this isn't a perfect seal here, then you know you got a problem with that articulator. It's a little easier than pulling out that calibration object. OK, and I did do a double check. I put the uh, top member on, put the bottom calibration object on uh, and then noticed that I was pretty much right at the bottom of it. So we're a good deal. OK, now this is a day after mounting. OK, with the die stone, this is a month. Check this out. OK, I was really surprised that we had that amount of dimensional change going on. In, and I'm sure it wasn't just the mounting stone. It was probably that I only waited 24 hours for the main pour and should have waited longer. <clears throat> and I haven't checked this on with other stones, just this, this die stone. But it points out to me that things happen 
continuously, very slowly over a long period of time. So be aware uh, that that these things can change. And actually, what I do now is, after I, you know, after I <clears throat> do all this and mount it, I've actually took a very fine die saw, cut through the mounting stone, and glue it back together with some CA glue, rather than mount that last little bit with the plaster. Uh, although I don't show that, and that's the only way I have found to make this stay perfectly accurate. But you got to let all your stone be set for like a month before you actually do a final um, realignment of this. Anyway, so just make sure that these are still good if you think you want to recalibrate your system using these blocks. All right. So the system is these two calibration blocks and then a plate, which they have one for each type of articulator uh, mounting plate. And this is for the 320. They look the same with a different uh, surface for different types of articulators, you know, whether they use a Stratus or whatever you happen to use or Panadent or an Artex, or in my case, I use the 320. So then once you've done that, you have to scan these things to calibrate your system. And if you go into your scan server under tools, here's this manage interface plates and you click that and that allows you to, then it prompts you through the system. You name what you're going to calibrate. Okay. So you can name it your own name. If you'd like, it comes up with um, a default at the top. Um, and then <clears throat> you go through a scanning process. Okay. So I went with a new calibration, gave it a name, and then just go through the process. It tells you what to do. Okay. Put on the lower plate, put it in the scanner, scan it. <sighs> and if you notice that was the upper plate, but you just follow the instructions and then it scans those things and puts those coordinates into your system. And then whenever you have a case that's mounted on that same articulator or on a calibrated articulator, it will um, capture the proper occlusion between the upper and lower arches without you actually having to make an occlusion scan, which is kind of cool actually. And it does work pretty good. So all you have to do while you're scanning is when you first start scanning, you'll see this interface plate option. You click down, you pick the, uh, the calibration file that you created. Okay. And then you proceed. And even though it shows the occlusion icon in your process bar up here, you won't actually have an occlusion scan. It'll skip over it. And you'll just be magically uh, aligned at the end of the scan. <clears throat> but do not trust this, at least until you, you know, you've gone through a couple cases. And I actually look really close at what I see on the screen. I'll do some, some 2D cross sections where I know I've got contact, make sure I've got contact, put some tape on my models, check those out, and really compare what I see on the screen during my inspect stage with what I see on the articulator, both sides of the arch, and make sure that this is indeed accurate. And um, for us, it was, okay? Now, again, we got the same problem. Um, it doesn't put the models in the right place. Although it does capture the correct um, tilt of the maxilla, which is kind of cool. <clears throat> so that we don't have to do, but we do have to correct the vertical position and the distance from the condyles. Okay, I, I, um, same thing. But again, like I said, the AP tilt is captured perfectly, which is pretty cool. It came from our mounting. And so I did, you know, superimpose these things so I could look at it. And sure enough, it was freaking perfect off the articulator. Now, same drill, 54 millimeters. We've got to pick it up. We've got to bring it out to about 100 millimeters and fix this position like we did the first time around. And again, this time it was more like 11 millimeters instead of 20. But nonetheless, you can, using the measurement tool, you can check this and get it about 100, 105, 110, somewhere in between, and then save that position. <laughs> and when you save that position, like we did last time, give it a different name because you know it's it's not going to be the same as if we didn't use the transfer plates so you can't use the same positioning file you made for the one we did before you got to call this transfer plate positioning file or give it a name that you know it came from using the transfer plates now the newest thing from three shape is this articulation adapter articulator adapter right which is um <clears throat> really just a, a, an ipad cover kind of the same stuff but it allows us, let me back up, it allows us to, you'll see how this works, to actually place the articulator inside the scanner. 
an E-series scanner, or I think a 900 or above. But it's a little different to use this. What you have to do is when you start scanning the case, you go into your settings and you tell it that you've got the articulator holder. Okay, you check that box. And then that tells it to prompt you to put the articulator in, put the holder in, do the stuff during the process. Okay, so you've got to make sure that you check that option. And then here's all it is. What, what, it, what it does is it causes the arm to roll to this position. You lay this on here, this little fold out iPad cover. It's got a circle and that's kind of where you want to have your models kind of over that. Okay. Um, and then um, you hold them together with they they give you a nice rubber band i lost mine so you just with a nice rubber band you hold it together so it doesn't move and you lay it in there like this <laughs> and the idea is that your occlusal plane is kind of flat it's more or less over this circle okay and then it just looks down from above and nothing moves while it's scanning the occlusion that's why you have to check that box so it'll prompt you you know to scan the right bite so you put the right side facing up then it'll tell you to turn around and do the left side bite uh, and i show this because the first time i thought it was broken and it wasn't it just gives you a funny i guess it's the view that i don't know what this is but it shows you the 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 occlusion scan in this orientation and it looks wrong i said hey this is wrong i did it again and again finally i realized oh it's just i'm looking at the top instead of the side of it okay so be aware of that that it gives you kind of a funny orientation and then it'll prompt you to to scan the other side okay to get the other side and then you align the left bite the right bite you you go through the process and align different left and right and then maxilla and then you get your proper occlusion <clears throat> so it really just keeps you from having to uh glue or stick any uh cast together to get to get an occlusion scan you still take the occlusion scan so now that we've gone over all this preliminary stuff, let's talk about the actual um, virtual articulator, how to use it properly, and initially with full arch articulator amount of models. And this is critical, okay, because that's what it's designed for. It's designed for full arch cases that are mounted on articulator, and you have them actually in real life in the same position that we have them in the articulator in the virtual world, <clears throat> which can create a problem if you're not on an articulator, and we will talk about that in just a minute. Um, I hope we stay good here, because right now i got a big thunderstorm going on and lots of wind and lightning, so if you hear that, if I blip out, well, we'll just pick this up later, okay? <laughs> but anyway, the occlusal compass. This is in the manual, okay, to show what the colors mean. Uh, I found this really confusing <laughs> myself. And I know a lot about this, but we'll go through it one at a time with the same colors, okay? Centric contacts, collision lines, these are here, okay? Um, the blue um, is basically, it, it's, it's a lateral movement is what it's called, but it's a working interference, a lateral movement. And then if you see blue, it means you have contact in lateral. OK, it also has this LPT, which is lateral protrusion in yellow. I've never actually seen that color on here. So I really don't you know, I really look for the blue to know when I've got a working interference, also called lateral intrusion by three shape. OK, now the green is a balancing interference. <clears throat> OK. And it's called media intrusion and MPT. This would be sort of like a, a medial protrusion, which is kind of an in-between a movement, part protrusive, part lateral, you know, an in-between movement. Again, the orange, never seen it. Okay, but if you do, that's what it is. And and um, although in my experience, it hasn't come up on any occlusion that I've adjusted. Okay, and then this ISS, this red, again, I don't really understand this. It's a big red area. What it looks like to me is more like broad centric. What it's really showing me and the way I treat this is the area of centric contact that you would get if you, for example, put a, a bunch of tape in and just ground the models right in the neighborhood of centric and just ground them around without really moving them very far. You'd kind of get this expanded broad centric marking. And that's what this is. And I really don't pay a lot of attention to these when I'm adjusting occlusion. I really pay attention, though, to my collision lines and my centric points of contact. Now, this. Is this important? Okay, this is so drawing on last week. This is an existing balancing interference. And what does this mean? Okay, what this means is that this is probably not real. 
Okay, because in my opinion, patients really don't generally walk around comfortable with balancing interferences. They can walk around with a working as long as it's in group function with teeth that are more anterior to this. But if we see this, what does it tell us? It tells us that our conjunctive guidance that we have set in the articulator is too low because we shouldn't be seeing this. So we do make the assumption that the dentist has enough wherewithal to have a cooler braided out any balancing interferences in the posterior this patient may have. So pretty much if we look at this, anything above this line is okay. Anything below this line is not good. So anything green is not good. Any protrusive interferences on posteriors is not good. So really green and gray are not good, okay? <clears throat> on existing teeth, number one, that's an indication of conjugate guidance and on crowns, number two, we wanna get it out. So, so step one, if we're gonna use the articulator is to eliminate any balancing interferences <clears throat> or what I would call destructive posterior interferences, either balancing or protrusive on existing teeth by increasing conjugate guidance. Okay, equally on both sides. And we, we talked about how that works uh, last week and that it does not work on the, on the working side, only on the balancing side. So you cannot eliminate any blue interferences by adjusting cosmic guidance. So here I went to 45 degrees. I usually go straight to 45, and if that doesn't work, I go straight to 60. I don't really try to get it perfect in between. And it eliminated them on that particular case. Now, here's another case with really flat occlusion. And when I see this, that's a hallmark that we're probably going to have some kind of balancing interferences show up. Uh, it's much more common. And sure enough, <clears throat> when I checked this one, even at 60 degrees, I still had this slight balancing interference here. And, you know, we can't go any higher than 60. And what this tells me is that this patient had a little existing balancing interference that, hey, you know, you may, if you want to let the dog know you found it, but he, he should know. He'll find it probably when it adjusts his crown. But we also see we've got some on the crown that we're designing here that we're going to want to deal with. And we've got some protrusive interferences. OK, so so step two. Basically, once we eliminate any destructive interferences, again, green and gray on the um, posterior teeth with conjure, existing teeth with the conjure guidance, then we start looking at our crown. And I designed the crown. I cut my contacts negative 0.03, as you can see here. Why? The reason why is because I want to be able to see them, okay, but I don't want them too heavy. I just found that negative 0.03 is just about perfect to make them visible, but not make them in the way, okay, so to speak, all right, because that's still only 30 microns of contact. Okay, so I get it set just like I like it. I get my contact, my tripod, if that's what I like. Here's one that probably needs to go away on an incline, um, almost tripod here, here. Get, yeah, I'm kind of a stickler for that. But anyway, and then we can start looking at our occlusion. Now, <clears throat> according to the way this should work, we should select these two only, okay? But what I have found out is that by designs must be checked. And this may be a little bug in the in the three shape because otherwise you can see the difference. If I don't have it checked, I see a little bit of balancing here, but I don't see all my other movements and I don't see my working interferences. I only see some balancing and some protrusive. But as soon as I click that, everything starts to change. It opens up more indication of what I actually have going on this crown. But be careful because it is allowing the crown to basically participate in the guidance of the mandible. So, you know, if these are too heavy, they will affect the guidance on the other teeth. And I'll show you how we work with that uh, in just a sec. All right. So when I uh, run through again with all, so always click, click, click every time, no matter what I'm doing, all three of these get checked. All right. In fact, it makes this whole thing kind of useless. And you want to make sure you click this so you get the occlusal compass or you won't see the colors to know what the movements are. And it doesn't take long to know, hey, gray is protrusive. This is balancing. This is working. This is broad centric. OK, red. And again, I kind of ignore the red more or less. Um, I use my collision lines to really find my centric contacts. So <clears throat> in this particular case, we're going to uh, you know, come in and I gradually remove the um, here's a protrusive contact on this ridge I don't want here's here's a balancing interference here's one over here that I don't want and I take the way away by hand I do not use the adapt designs okay and I don't like the adapt designs because it takes away 
too much, even when you have it set at 0.1, that's, that's way too much. And again, here, this working, this wouldn't bother me because I see it in group function all the way up, okay, all along this whole posterior. So this is not destructive. It's going to hurt the patient. But I want to make sure that this isn't acting alone. So I will take some of it off, and you can see how it fades out. These are still here strong, so this is not a destructive working interference. Okay, and again, I don't adapt designs because they really take away far too much. Okay, and I'd rather do this by hand. Um, they take away everything, including centric, when you do that. Um, I, I, to me, not a good way to adjust occlusion. So I've worked out all my interferences, my working, my balancing, my protrusive. I've got what I call broad centric, they call immediate side shift. And then when I look at my remaining uh, points of contact, they satisfy me. All right. And I look and I can fade in the, the, um, the broad centric or the immediate side shift uh, color scheme from the articulator and see that that's indeed what I've got. All right. I did lose this little contact here that was my tripod, but that's okay because it was in a protrusive interference. So um, once I have this, then I will cut my occlusion to where I want it, depending on the material. And this you got to work out for yourself. For me, in my system, with my milling machine and my everything, in my environment, 20 microns out of occlusion seems to be perfect for Emacs. When we do that and I click it, my marks go away. Again, we don't want to do this before we're done because we can't see our sentry. And <clears throat> that turns out giving me exactly at the bench what I saw on the screen here with just bare contact. And if you do this, you'll be surprised at how good the occlusion is at the bench if this case is on an articulator. Okay. And here's one where, you know, sometimes you get your nice little contacts. I mean, I'll eliminate things on the incline here and here and here, or try to move this one closer to the fossa. And, you know, we, we end up with occlusion that doesn't show a lot of interferences and we don't have a lot to do to fix this up. But here's the big question, and here's where so many people have trouble with virtual articulation, which is the fact that almost all of our cases, at least in most labs, I say half of mine are on these little plastic articulators, whether it's an Orbix like this or a Vertex or whatever is out there. But what do we know about this situation from two weeks ago? Remember, okay, we know that there's big problems here because this is non-physiologic condylar position, therefore non-physiologic movements. Non-physiologic geometry, condyles in the total wrong place. Tooth guidance is only. These really do not contribute to anything. They just hold the models together. You're almost as good not even having this except for tapping and centric. But these are no good for, for movements outside of centric. Quadrants are even worse. Why? Okay, drawing on last week because we don't have any balancing side guidances whatsoever on this. And so the movements and occlusion that you see on the screen of VA will not be seen by the technician, all right? Because on the articulator, we have condyles, we have conjure guidance, we have a physiologic system, and it's going to guide that mandible in a way that's way different than what happens here in this situation. And so what happens is people take the time to adjust their occlusion. The technicians get in and go, man, I got to adjust all this stuff, buddy, come on. I mean, I got all these lateral interferences and all these eccentric interferences. And the reason is because you're seeing stuff that doesn't exist really in the real world but it's what it's all we have to work with so there's this disconnect between what's happening on the screen here and what's happening on the articulator here okay and so it's a, it's a source of frustration for the bench technicians trying to adjust all this stuff that you didn't see because you were working in this computer on an articulator all right so the question is can we or should we even use VA when we have this situation with a plastic non-physiologic articulator? And it's a really good question. So <clears throat> I tried a couple different things. I said, well, maybe if I set the guidance to zero, it'll let everything kind of slide across each other 
and maybe that'll represent what's going on here and that didn't really work too good then i thought well maybe i need to move the model way up here set the guidance to zero because this now is more like what i have with my articulator right and so if i'm going to do this i got to set the guidance to zero and i'm going to increase my bennett to 15 which i do anyway because that's the average number i don't know why the default is 10 with three shape and if anybody knows how to change the defaults of 34 degrees here and 10 degrees here in three shape please let me know because i can't find that and i got to change this every single time uh, i do a case but nonetheless <clears throat> interestingly okay and i do this because it opens up the articulator the 50 degree bit it lets it move as much as it can just move around kind of like uh, you get when you do tooth guidances and turns out the placement is not real critical but up in this area with 0 and 15 you know just move it up and I kind of usually get my occlusal plane kind of even but it's not that critical as long it turns out as long as it's in this general area the occlusal plane is flat and zero guidance with 15 minute if you do that suddenly this is going to work more like a, um, a non-articulator all right and then when we start adjusting these so even when we're not quite in this it doesn't really matter you know this is super arbitrary and actually we usually disconnect this in order to move through our our at once we're done with centric to move through our movements <laughs> so once i get this in a place that works pretty good i can save it right and i can call it um i call this orbix i, I named it orbix i save this position and i can call it back up whenever i have an orbix it puts it in this place real quick and easy and makes that whole process easy okay but when i start looking all of a sudden i've got stuff everywhere on my existing teeth i've got i've got uh protrusive interferences balancing interferences working interferences i got broad center i got stuff which is what we want to see these teeth are sliding all across each other so this is perfect but and it's what the technician's going to see at the bench so now when we start removing all in one air interferences green being um a balancing blue being working gray being a protrusive interference okay then you suddenly your technicians at the bench are going to go hey man perfect because now you're doing it wrong but you're you're doing it with tooth guidances all right and again remember that we're going to have to check this because it really brings a bunch more in and i don't know why it shouldn't but if it's not checked we don't see our working we don't see our protrusive and we don't see our balancing interferences on our crown don't know why exactly uh possibly a bug anyway i wanted to check this <clears throat> to make sure that you know indeed the guided by designs is working so i just raised my occlusal way up I, it's got a ton of contact, so this should take over all my movements. And sure enough, when I ran through the articulator, I saw nothing on my other teeth. So yes, this does work, okay? But again, so you got to be careful that you're not letting your crown lift off other teeth. So just be aware of this, but you need that checked in order to see all your movements. So I just undid, went back down, and now I'm looking at what's going on on the other teeth. We always definitely want to see that. And here's what I have on my crown. We can see the couple little problems that we need to uh, fix. Let me back up. You know, it's a little protrusive, a little tiny bit of working, a little protrusive there, no balancing. I took those out. Kind of went in real close to kind of look. It all looks really good to me. Okay. <clears throat> so after I take those all out, all right, uh, and adjust my occlusion, uh, now I have, and there's a little tiny working was right there. Okay. Then I cut my occlusion to my 0.02, which may not be right for you. That's just for me. In fact, I cut gold crowns to 0.07 and believe it or not, zirconia to a one click higher, which is 0.12, which is crazy. I can't explain this. I don't know why, but if I don't cut a gold a little more than Emacs and don't cut zirconia a little more than gold, um, we get heavy occlusion. Beats me, haven't figured that one out. Uh, it just works, so that's that's what we do. But again, you know, these are the various articulators that are available. Um, the Stratus is is actually kind of close, okay, in terms of it's. I don't know. I don't know why it's so different here than here. Why the defaults are different. All everything's pretty much wrong. But why Three Shape doesn't give us a selection for plastic, I don't know. Because what they what they should do is we should be able to select this and have the placement automatic, in my opinion. Okay, so 
list. Anyway, um, and I apologize for going kind of fast here, but it's a lot of stuff and we have an hour uh, and I'm actually a little bit behind. But talking small design, let me talk a little bit about this and just give you some tips, okay? Now, we already said the only way to transfer maxillary tilt and cant from the articulator to the, to the design software is with these transfer plates. But they come at a price, and they're tricky to set up. Once you're set up, they're good. But again, only on a calibrated articulator, only on the articulator that you have, okay? It doesn't get the position right until you fix it and save a, a positioning file for this, okay? But I have clients that have 320s, and they mount their own cases, and we found it doesn't work with those because they don't necessarily have a perfect zero pin. Their articulators are not necessarily perfectly calibrated. They go out, and so I don't trust this unless I'm really mounting on a known good articulator, and all my uh, articulators in the lab are known good. So enter the proper stick bite, okay? In other words, a stick bite taken with the incisal ledges exposed. This is the problem because we can't use a stick bite during mounting unless the incisal ledges are exposed so we can either stick it in the face bow to double check or on the mounting platform. So it's got to be taken this way. It's a key for your doctors, and they just need to put their stick across and not block the incisal ledges. Now we can we can prop up or move this tape, whatever system you have, to get the stick straight, right? So that I now know that I have a horizontal mounting or a mounting that's parallel to the patient's pupils. Right? So this will bring to bear the actual um, cant, if there is any, so long as the stick is taken right and so long as I can have it in place while I'm mounting. And then the cool thing is you can put that on your model <clears throat> and scan it for your pre-prep scan and now I have a horizontal axis in my software, so I can align my things in the software. So when I looked at my articulator here, it's obviously off, right? So I've got to change this tilt to get my stick straight to my horizontal. Now I've got my horizontal axis. And <clears throat> you can turn on the grid lines with that little measurement tool, the little tape measure tool, okay? And, and start to use this for your small design. But these grid lines are really distracting. And if you move far enough back to make them go away, your, your, your object's too small. So uh, by sheer luck, I found out that if you do a, a control key and hit your scroll wheel, it turns that fine grid into this grid. And now it doesn't get so much in the way, yet our primary axes are there. And what we, this is plenty good enough for keeping everything horizontal and making sure that our small design is parallel to the horizon or at least parallel to the stick bite or the pupils or whatever it is that you really seem to like. But critical, right, that we have a horizontal so we can get a vertical. I mean, this relationship between the, the incisal plane of the centrals and the embrasure, the facial embrasure, is absolutely critical. And it's got to mesh with the patient's face. Therefore, we need that stick bite to be able to verify that we are indeed horizontal. So I've got to make sure that, that everything is right. I, I want photographs of this. If I can get them, and you know, that will come up that, in, in another discussion. We talked a little bit about that uh, in, the, in part one. But now here, when I start my smell design, I can have a horizontal. And I've got a horizontal here for my two centrals. I've got a horizontal, you know, if indeed you believe the the lateral should be the same length, generally so, yeah, you know, maybe a little asymmetry is nice. Tip of the cuspids, and then move up. I can see all my teeth, you know, is this okay to have a first by a little longer? Yeah, sure. I like a little asymmetry, you know, here and there, but at least I know where I'm at, and I know I'm controlled because I got a proper stick bite. I took the pre-prep scan, and now I can phase it in and make sure that I have my horizontal properly in the articulator. Because otherwise, how do you know? You don't. This is one big shortcoming of virtual articulation, especially in smile design, is you don't have any reference for this. You have to have a proper stick bite. And again, by proper, I mean one <clears throat> where um, the size ledges are exposed. All right. This was a little bit far apical, this one this guy took, but it's okay. All right. And we scan enough of it to see what we need. So again, uh, here, notice I got the this little ball right in the center of my pen. No easy task, but now I know my articulator is square to me, 
okay, sitting in my chair. And then when I fade away the articulator and tilt it down, that arrow should point right to my embrasure if I want it in the middle, okay? And if my mounting was right and if everything was right, which if you control this, it will be. And then, you know, this measuring tool is great, especially with the small grid gong, because I can check to make sure the width of my centrals is pretty much symmetrical. OK, and, you know, you can draw in your uh, golden proportion lines. You can measure things if, if you want to go to that extent, completely up to you. But once you have the horizontal and vertical correct, especially here, the rest just kind of falls into place. And without this tool, uh, it could really be a problem. All right. And again, <clears throat> remember, this is supposed to be used as collide designs only for interior guidance, right? That's what it's for. It's so that we can design our cuspids to lift off of our posterior teeth, okay? But no, you want to always use this. So again, click, 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 and click, okay, on the occlusal compass because you want to see what movements are being recorded. You know, what type are they? Because that's really, really important. Okay, so here in this case, I've got a nice heavy working, which I want on a cuspid. I've got nothing on these teeth. Looks pretty good. But is this too steep? I don't know. You know, and trying to look at it doesn't tell me much. So first thing I do, and if I see blue here, I know this isn't steep enough because this lateral movement, working movement in this way, should clear all those uh, marks off of my posterior teeth, ideally. So I'll remove a little bit, right, <clears throat> with my tool, and then I'll do it again, and lo and behold, boom, now I've got some working interference here, which means I was correct before. So either add a little back, well, actually just you know, um, click undo in this particular case. And then over here, I can see I've got some protrusive here. And again, this distal lingual incline of the cuspid uh, is supposed to be the guiding surface to harmonize with the protrusive contacts on your interior teeth, okay? So a little bit of protrusive interference here is actually good. I have a teeny bit here, so maybe I want to increase this angle, make this ridge a little bigger and increase this angle just a little bit to lift off, um, to clear this protrusive guidance. But again, back to this, add a little back. You know, I went on this side before I undid this side, so I add a little back. Add a little back there, and then sure enough, now I've got guidance that's clearing these teeth. I saw this little bit of protrusive, so you know, again, the 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 the, the detail to which you want to go with this is is kind of up to you. Again. <clears throat> You know, I took a little bit of this protrusive, this heavy protrusive on this central off. What I want to see is just a little bit of gray in these areas. Okay, now I'm getting close. And I've got some nice protrusive here, a eh, little bit there. Maybe I want to increase this, but I'm not sure if I did in this case or not. But that's the idea. It's just fine to harmonize the protrusive. We have to in the front. We know that that's good. Um, and again, with this, with the occlusal compass and knowing what's what, we can accomplish that. So as soon as I did that, notice what happened here. I got a little protrusive on my lateral. And that right there, let me tell you, is the kiss of death. Here and here is okay. I don't mind that so much as long as it's in harmony with this one. Okay. But this is the culprit that really is responsible for a lot of those um, disto incisal failures on laterals. Okay, those are working movements. So we definitely want that not to be there. Okay, make sure that we get rid of those. Anything coming from the fossa up to the meso incisal in harmony with these is pretty much okay. But this I like pretty well, okay, for my smile design. Now, I've heard a lot of people say, well, hey, if I get a pre-op or I get temps, you know, why do I have to worry about the lingual inclines? Because I can get them with morph to pre-prep. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Number one, you're, um, you're, you're allowing the... You're assuming that the doctor knows what he's doing when he when he does the temps, you know, or this was anywhere near correct preoperatively. So it's not a great way to go. OK, I don't like this. I actually in fact, I never use morph to pre prep. I'll use a pre prep as a guide, but I never morph to it because it just screws up my <laughs> my tooth form, even if it's a good study model, still screws it up. As you know, it puts a lot of extra stuff down around the margins, and I'm not a big fan. I'm a big fan of it. In fact, I don't use it at all. But I do use the ghost image of a pre prep if it's good 
to at least guide me in my incisal length and my centrals and, and to give me some information. But like in this case, when we actually started modeling, our centric was at this level. You can see that you know th this this pre prep uh, had no centric on these cuspids. So um, be super super careful of of that. And, and again, my recommendation is not to use it. Um, I think it actually causes more harm than good. But back to the optimizing occlusion discussion we had earlier. <clears throat> okay. It really, I found it not to be necessary when I'm using transfer plates. It, um, that, if done right, is really, really, really uh, quite accurate, so surprisingly accurate. But you got to be careful. You can use optimizing only if, one, their, their ticket meter is calibrated. I mean, you could use transfer plates only if you know the articulator was calibrated, if you know that you have a zeroed pin, if you know that it's a local mounting, you can't trust mountings that were delivered to you even on the same type of articulator, okay? So transfer plates are good, they're kind of neat, they're not cheap either, um, but be careful. This is super cool, this works really good, but it doesn't capture the tilt, uh, you know, of the case, and you will definitely need in any case, you always need a stick bite for interior cases, to get really a handle on and control of the horizontal plane, which is critical in all of these cases. Now, um, <clears throat> we used to, of course, glue our models together. That's a problem. We had a lot of bad occlusion. And I just throw this in real quick. What I found out was that the hot glue stays soft for about 30 minutes. And so whenever we had, whenever we have to glue, if you're doing this, make sure you get a, a can of can, a, a canned air, Turn it upside down so the cold liquid comes out and freeze that glue before you go scan occlusion, okay? That'll stop it from moving slightly during the scanning process, which it does. But back to our optimization, we would see a lot of this when we would be gluing our models together. Since we've used uh, these new accessories, this has gotten way better. But I saw a lot of this, and we had to do a lot of, of optimization. And I, you can see from the real case, this was closed. This is a big problem. This is 0.12 millimeters. That, that's a lot, okay? And so when I hit optimize, it went down 0.17. This came into contact. I checked all around. In this case, it worked. I'll usually click it, look really carefully and see what it's doing and see if it fixes a problem that I found. But I'll look first to see if I see a problem in my occlusion and then see if this fixes it. And maybe in probably less than half the cases, it fixes it. And the other more than half the cases makes it worse, okay? And then if it fixed it and you like what you see, you can save that. But once you do this, that's where you are, okay? You're not going to go back. And in this particular case, it showed a lot of extra occlusion, which would have been bad news for the crown of the lab. And so, again, occasionally it actually is a help. But just like I said, use it with caution and look at what it's doing carefully, okay? In a case like this, <clears throat> you know, when I tried it, it did, it did a number like that, which as soon as you see that, boom, you know, just watch. You'll see, yeah, that's no good. And you just undo, okay? You undo that right away and then move on. Because, and if you have a problem with your occlusion that Optimize didn't fix, then you got to use other options. Maybe uh, go back and rescan the occlusion. Okay. Um, you can drag the handles. And anybody that does that is, I'm sorry, you're an idiot because there's no way to control this at all. I mean, you, just, you have no idea how much you're protruding through. We're even protruding opposing arches through. Okay. Here. And there's just no control of what you're doing if you try to manually move them. But I see we're almost at an hour. Uh, I hope all this information <laughs> wasn't too fast because it was quite a bit, but it really isn't complex. It's, it's, uh, re it's very logical. And, you know, once you take the time to really understand, you know, green and gray are the bad colors, blue and red are good. Um, as far as occlusion goes, uh, position of the articulator is critical. W the, the, the neighborhood in which to move it if you're on plastic. And, and check it, you know, at the bench. And you'll see that suddenly the, the virtual articulator will actually really become a great tool. I use it on every single case. It's part of my routine. And my technicians at the bench are just like, man, we're loving this. What are you doing? And I said, hey, I just figured something out. And it's that thing about, you know, moving the occlusal uh, plane way up 
setting the country guys to zero and bend it to 15 when you're on plastic. So just that alone will make it work a lot better for you. And with that, um, we're done. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Al. Um, at this time, I do want to open it up for a few quick questions. I know we're, we're hitting that 12 o'clock mark here um, in Eastern time, but we did have one come in, so I want to make sure that this one gets answered. Okay. Um, Robert, Robert asks, how thick is the glaze material in a controlled setting? I realize you can overdo it. Is it glaze interference? Oh, well, you know, that's something that you really can't control. I'm sure, I guess you're talking about glaze on any kind of an all ceramic, whether it's zirconia or Emacs. And, you know, how thick the glaze is, I don't know that you could answer that. That's something you're going to have to work out. But what does happen, though, is it's relatively consistent. And so, you know, once, you know, if you're, some glazes are quite thick, um, the GC stuff. Uh, the luster paste is quite thick and some glazes are quite thin. Me on my zirconia, I don't really use glaze. I hand polish. I, I polish on a with flower pumice on a rag wheel and I do uh, all my coloring um, in the green state and very, very well, almost no glaze. Sometimes a little bit of had to go stain on a facial um, surface or an outer surface, but generally I stay away from it, but that's not, that's not most everybody's world. But once you, you know, see what it's doing to your occlusion, you can compensate for that in your cutback in your software. But that's, that's the only way uh, that you can do it. I, and I don't think you can really put a number on it, but you can compensate again, because technicians seem to be relatively consistent in how they apply whatever it is you're using. And that's how I would answer that question. All right, thanks. Um, I don't have any other questions that have come in. So I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up for today. Okay, okay. Again, uh, we, we will be sending out an email with the recording and a, a link to take the CE test for CE credits. Um, please allow 24 to 48 hours on that. And if you do have any questions, feel free to email us at webinar at witmix.com. And again, thank you for everybody for attending and have a wonderful day. Hey, and note the email at the bottom of uh, us at Gmail. If you know, you can, you can fire something to me. No problem. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm checking all the time like everybody else. So um, everybody have a great day. Thanks for your time. All right. Thanks everybody. Bye.